10 minutes to impact. I warned you, I won't warn you again. Michael shouts through the small retractable slide that serves as a peephole on the shelter door. Despite being several inches of solid steel, the rhythmic pounding of a sledgehammer on the other side can still be heard inside the small shelter. Outside that door, a man sweats profusely as he hammers away at the locking mechanism to the shelter door. Come on, there's more than enough room. I told you weeks ago to prepare. I told you there'd be no room with us here. I can't be responsible for you and your family. I won't be responsible. Michael shouts again through the peephole. The man pounding outside the door can't see Michael's hands clutching the old 30 6 The barrel's large for a rifle, but small enough to fit through the peephole. I've got my family out here. Public shelter's all full up. Where are we supposed to go? Let us in. The rhythmic pounding continues, the hammer pounding away at the locking mechanism keeping the underground shelter protected from whatever might happen in the outside in the next 10 minutes. Robert, get away from this door. I won't warn you again. The pounding continues, the warning ignored. Michael turns to look behind him, nodding at Alexandra, his wife. Cover Lily's eyes. Lily, darling, cover your ears. The eight-year-old girl does as she's told, her eyes wide with panic as her mother clutches her close and puts her hands over her eyes. Michael then looks at his older son Luke and simply nods. The asteroid still hasn't hit yet, but the old world died hours ago as panic set in when the general population could no longer find appropriate shelter. At 16 years old, Luke was old enough for what was coming next. He had to be. Luke nods at his father. Michael lifts the rifle to the peephole and sticks the edge of the barrel out the other side. He doesn't have to aim, his target's so close it's impossible to miss. Bam! The rifle thunders inside the small cramped shelter, amplifying the retort to a painful degree. Luke gasps, face white with terror, but he holds his tears in, even as they threaten to squeeze out of the corner of his eyes. Outside the door, the hammering has stopped. Michael pulls the rifle back inside the shelter, grim determination on his face. He spent years in the surface fighting in the deserts of both Iraq and Afghanistan. This wasn't his first kill, but this one, it's just plain wrong. This was his neighbor. Two months ago, he was borrowing the portable grill for a family camping trip, but that was the old world before news of the asteroid. Outside the door, there's a single soft sob, and Michael presses an eye back up against the people. Standing 20 feet down the underground corridor his grandfather had dug during the start of the Cold War is Carol. Carol, I'm, I'm so sorry, Carol. Listen, I begged him to stop. I, we just can't. We don't have enough room, and I've got two children. You knew, you knew. For weeks, you know we wouldn't be able to fit you in. Carol stands in shock, tears streaming from her eyes as she gazes down at the body of her husband. Carol, Carol, you have to go, darling. You have to go, and you have to find somewhere to shelter. Find a home with a basement or a parking garage somewhere, or Carol, you have to hurry, please. She doesn't reply. Instead, she slowly turns around and walks back up the 20 feet of stairs, leading back up to the outside world. Inside the shelter, Michael sighs and slumps back on the wall behind him. The rifle nearly falls out of his hands. He pulls himself together. This is not a time to be weak. If they were going to survive what was coming next, if anyone was going to survive, they'd have to be strong. Michael joins his wife sitting on the floor and kneels down, gently pulling Lily's fingers out of her ears. Shh, it's okay baby, that's it. You don't have to plug your ears anymore. Everything's alright. Daddy, I heard a gunshot. I know baby, I… Dad was just warning off Mr. Trucker is all. Luke is quick to interject. His father nods his approval at him, then he turns his attention to the shelves of supplies and equipment behind him. Luke, go and fetch that old radio, will you? Luke nods. The radio is practically ancient at this point, something his grandfather stashed away down here in preparation for the end of the world. It picks up both AM and FM and runs off batteries, which they have plenty of. With what experts on TV have predicted happening, it's likely that radio will be the only means of communication left very soon. Then again, with what the experts on TV have predicted, Luke's not sure there'll be anyone left to communicate with at all. He shakes those thoughts away and cranks the radio on, immediately picking up a station still broadcasting. Whoever's on at the other end obviously chose not to seek shelter probably figuring there wasn't much point in it. There's many like him, millions of people crowd the streets of every major city in the world just waiting for the end. Some of them never bothered to try and seek shelter, some like Mr. Trucker and his wife were simply unlucky and couldn't find any. Is believed to be sheltering underground somewhere under the Rocky Mountains along with his cabinet and most senior members of the government. The mountains are largely made of very tough granite and it's believed by some, well hoped, that it'll afford at least some protection from the asteroid impact. It all depends, of course, on exactly where the asteroid hits. Predictions have swung back and forth since discovery of Aster 2022, with some believing it'll strike directly on the coast of Spain, and others sure it'll strike a few dozen miles off the coast into the ocean. In that event, Michael grabs the radio from his son and turns the tuning knob. He knows precisely what'll happen in either event, as it's all the media's talked about for the last four weeks since the discovery of Aster 2022. Regardless of where the asteroid lands, humanity will go extinct. 
And yet, here he was, huddled with his family in an old Cold War shelter his grandfather dug with his own two hands. What else was he supposed to do? He'd heard reports of families taking the easy way out as soon as two weeks ago, but he couldn't stomach that thought. If there was a chance, he was going to fight for it. The knob finally lands on another station. This is very troubling time, friends. I don't know what happens next. I don't know whether this is judgment day for us all, the end of times, or for any form of the apocalypse. Whatever your faith, all I hope is that you have lived a good, happy life. And with 1 minute and 38 seconds until impact, I leave you with this. Should any of us pull through this, my hope is that we forget the things that made our world evil. War, hate, prejudice, and never forget what made our civilization great. Love, respect, and empathy. Amen and goodbye. Amen. Michael whispers to himself as the station goes off the air, his eyes locked on the door. He cranks the power knob and turns the radio off, seating himself between his wife and his son. Little Lily is still in her mother's arms. She's been brave ever since the family packed into the shelter about an hour ago and hasn't even cried once. Michael kisses her on the forehead and then turns to kiss his son on the forehead. He puts his arms around his family and pulls his wife close for a quick kiss. Everyone, go ahead and close your eyes. Open your mouth to equalize the air pressure and plug your ears. Impact A massive asteroid the size of Rhode Island smashes into the upper layers of the atmosphere. Its collision course with Earth puts it on a very shallow angle resulting in it starting to penetrate our atmosphere somewhere off the coast of Portugal over the Atlantic. The asteroid physically compresses the air in front of it, creating a superheated shockwave that rides just in front and below the asteroid. Moving at over 20,000 miles an hour, it lights up the sky over Portugal and very quickly crosses into Spain. The shockwave is so intense that as it flies over Spanish cities, thousands of people who couldn't find shelter or decided the impact simply wasn't survivable are all knocked down to the ground by the force of the passing asteroid. As the massive space rock nears Madrid, the shockwave below is so intense that people are knocked down with enough force to kill them. About 34 seconds after first making contact with the uppermost layers of the atmosphere, the asteroid slams straight into the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains that separate Spain from France. Predicting the impact location of such a massive, fast-moving object was always difficult, and the best estimates have been hundreds of miles off. In the first nanosecond before impact, the massive superheated air in front of the asteroid immediately incinerates any plants, animals, or humans within half a dozen miles. The air is so compressed in front of the gargantuan rock that it actually smashes into the rocky terrain with enough force to melt it to lava a few inches deep. Then the rock itself actually strikes. In an instant, the asteroid and half a mile wide, 300 feet deep area of rock are vaporized. Then the shockwave and heat reaching temperatures as hot as the sun melt rock in the impact zone down to a half mile deep. The shockwave propagates through the ground faster than the speed of sound, and completely tears apart any living thing caught in its path for several miles. The mighty Pyrenees Mountains themselves are shattered by the impact, as a crater a hundred miles across quickly forms, splitting the mighty mountain range nearly in two. The shockwaves continue racing out and hit the first major population centers within a minute of impact. Buildings, vehicles, and people are absolutely annihilated by the force of the shockwave, torn to shreds and tossed about like ragdolls. At about the same time, a massive plume of molten rock shoots up into the sky from the center of the crater. Trillions of tons of molten lava fire into the atmosphere and even beyond it. In space around the Earth, rocks from the impact have already been flung with enough force to eventually leave Earth's orbit. Some will end up catching up with Earth again in a few thousand or millions of years. Others will float forever in the void between the planets inside our solar system. Still others will end up crash landing on Venus and Mars, escapees from a dying Earth. The massive lava plume comes crashing back down to Earth, too hot to be chilled by its flight into the sky, and washes over an area dozens of square miles wide. Anything that might have somehow survived the shockwave of the impact will now be bathed in fiery lava as it rains from the heavens. The shockwave continues to propagate out across Europe, leveling cities all the way out to Portugal in the west and Paris in the east. In the English Channel in the Mediterranean Sea, massive tsunamis half a mile high build up and speed out at several hundred miles an hour. The water will reach all the way to London itself in the north and destroy the entire southern Mediterranean coastline of Africa. It will even reach all the way to Turkey, where its seaside communities will be flooded with waves three meters high. Tens of trillions of tons of vaporized rocks are picked up by hurricane-force winds created by the impact and spread across the upper atmosphere. This will turn the air poisonous across all of Europe and northern Africa, but trade winds will eventually bring the poisonous atmosphere as far as the east coast of the US and the Middle East. By then, it'll be more of a health hazard than a deadly threat, however. But for Europeans without breathing apparatuses, their next breath could be lethal. Billions of tons of molten rocks hurtled up into space now start to make their way back down again. The meteor rain of half-molten lava will reach all the way to Asia and the United States, 
starting massive fires across every continent on Earth except for Australia. Millions will die from this deadly rain as it smashes into cities and towns as the deadliest form of hail humanity ever witnessed. The fires will kill anyone who survives the crushing rain. 28 minutes after impact, it starts with a slow tremor, and then suddenly the shockwave of the impact hits the family shelter with enough force to physically pick up and throw the family around the room. Lily screams as she's hurtled out of her mother's arms, but it's over in an instant and nobody's seriously hurt. Michael calms the family best he can. He's prepared them for this and they all know what comes next. The shockwave of the impact circles the earth and hits them again. The second time though it was much milder, simply rattling the contents of the shelf for a bit before passing on. It'll circle the earth three or four more times, losing exponentially more energy with each pass but still detectable on seismometers. The first rock falls with a thundering crash somewhere above about 50 feet south of them. Michael does the calculations and figures it must have hit somewhere around the back of the house. The shelter is about 35 feet from the back porch, dug 20 feet into the ground. He's pretty sure they're safe, but as more impacts are heard and felt, he becomes seriously concerned about being buried alive. He has no idea, but it's raining mountains over the American East Coast, the Pyrenees Mountains specifically. Everybody, hang on to each other, he shouts as he grabs onto Lily's hand and pulls her close. He then hugs his wife and Luke. The family clings to each other as the deadly rain of ballistic rock missiles washes over the community. Six hours after impact, it stopped raining rocks about half an hour ago, but Michael wanted to be cautious. Now, well, he supposes there's nothing to do but survey the damage. He passes Lily off to his wife and nods at Luke. Reflexively, he reaches for his rifle and shoulders it. He's not really sure why, though. Maybe in case there's other people desperate enough to try to take his shelter away from him and his family. However, after hours of raining rocks, he doubts anybody caught out in the open could have survived, or anyone sheltering the buildings without basements for that matter. He opens the peephole on the door and looks out of it. Thankfully, the tunnel leading to the outside hasn't collapsed. He was worried about that, and he had stuck two shovels inside the shelter just in case. The door itself takes significant effort to push open, made worse by the fact that his dead neighbor's body still lays where it fell six hours ago. As the pair emerge from the shelter, Michael closes his eyes. He almost doesn't want to look, seeing what remains will make it all too real. The end of the world. But he opens them as acrid smoke hits its nostrils and makes his eyes water. What he sees is nothing short of complete, utter devastation. A fiery, burning hell has come to earth. His former suburban neighborhood completely unrecognizable. It had promised to be a bright, sunny summer day as the family headed to the shelter at 8.30 a.m. Few clouds in the sky, but not enough to compete with the gloriously rising sun. Michael's mind reels from the sight of it all. The sky above is now black and gray from massive plumes of ash riding up across the entire American East Coast. But the clouds are weird. They look like ripples on a lake and are moving quickly across the sky to the west. The upper atmosphere is in absolute turmoil even hours after impact, and in a day, ash from the burning cities in Europe will reach America. Michael has no way of knowing if he'd ever see the sun again, though many scientists had predicted as much. The family home is nothing but ash. The fires were so intense that they'd burned everything but the concrete foundation and rock fireplace. The intensity of the flames had thankfully made them short-lived though, and the area around the shelter is relatively safe. All over the ground lay shards of obsidian, globs of molten lava that had risen high enough into the atmosphere to cool before impacting the ground and bursting like bombs, shredding anyone and anything in the vicinity with razor-sharp obsidian shards. In the distance, where the city skyline used to be visible, all that Michael and Luke can see are the skeletal remains of a few large buildings jutting up into the skyline. It's difficult to see more than that due to how thick the smog-like conditions have become. Coughing and choking, the two quickly decide to head back underground. Michael whispers a silent thank you to his long-dead grandfather for the foresight to install an air filtration system in what was supposed to be a nuclear war fallout shelter. One week after impact. There are still batteries for the radio, but Luke hasn't bothered to turn it on for days. There would be no point. Nobody was transmitting anything anymore. For two days after impact, they could still pick up transmissions from the west coast, which had been far less pummeled by the initial impact. However, all of North America is in flames now from the massive wildfires which run completely unchecked across the continent. The fires have run straight through major cities and the notoriously dry west coast went up like a tinderbox. Before the last radio station went down, they had relayed transmission from somewhere in Europe, possibly Germany. Incredibly, somebody had survived the initial impact event, but the news was not good. Hundreds of millions killed in the impact alone, an estimated 1 billion dead across Europe and Africa from tsunamis, the shower of impact debris, and the global wildfires. The air outside the shelter is still not safe to breathe without a respirator. It's choked with ash and toxic vapors given off by burning of trillions of tons of various building materials and other chemical products that make up our cities. The shelter's air filtration system works overtime, and Michael thanks his grandfather daily for having the foresight to install it. 
Without a doubt, though, anyone not inside a shelter with a similar system is dead by now. Michael's thoughts sometimes turn to his neighbor, Carol, but he chases those thoughts away as soon as they appear. There's six months' worth of food and water in the shelter. It's cramped, uncomfortable, and a bit claustrophobic, but the family has no choice. It's simply not safe to go outside yet, so they wait. Three months after impact, Michael takes a gulp of air. It's not fresh by any means, but not immediately toxic either. At least it no longer smells of cooked flesh. Whatever toxins still linger in the air, there's nothing he can do about it as the shelter's air filtration system broke down a week ago. Staying in the shelter is no longer feasible, and he calls down to the family. Luke, go ahead and bring your sister and mother up. They won't have to pass the remains of their former neighbor. Michael had personally removed those himself on one of his solo trips up top. This is Lily's first time out of the shelter and she coughs profusely as she breathes in the slightly toxic atmosphere. Michael frowns, but there's simply nothing he can do for her. He'd like to go and find some masks or respirators, anything. But there doesn't seem to be anything left to scavenge. The fires have claimed everything. Maybe there's something deeper in the city, though. Honey, stay here with Lily. Maybe try, I don't know, maybe we can make some kind of above-ground shelter? Alexandra nods slowly, then looks around dejectedly. What kind of shelter can she possibly make when there's just nothing left? But she quickly recomposes herself. There's no time for defeatist attitudes. Luke, you and I will head to the city. Maybe we'll find, I don't know, something. Luke nods slowly. Michael feels the futility in his son's gaze, but they have to at least try. Surely the fires couldn't have consumed everything. The hike into the city is more difficult than expected. The two have to climb over the molten slag heaps that are all that remains of vehicles caught out in the open after impact. Most of what's left is ash, though, with here and there a surviving support beam sticking out of the remains of homes and small buildings. Visibility has improved, but not by much. Michael can see a few miles ahead to where he knows the downtown area of the city starts. The skeletal remains of the tall buildings that used to rule its skyline are now gone collapsed in on themselves or knocked over by the massive windstorms that rocked the planet for days after impact. Every mile that passes, Michael keeps hoping that he'll spot something. He's just not sure what, just anything. Some sign that civilization has survived, but each mile brings more disappointment. He knows where the major shopping centers are by memory, but nothing but ashes and ruins remain. The fires have completely gutted even the largest of the big box stores. Humanity has never seen fires on this scale. Only the dinosaurs before them saw the horrors of a planet on fire. After a few more miles, Michael stopped, sighing dejectedly. Hold on, son. Let's just… let's go back. There's nothing out here. Nothing at all. Luke doesn't reply. He merely nods in agreement. He's too tired to keep going and much like the rest of the family doesn't even believe there's a point anymore. That night, the family has their first dinner outside, but they can't even see the moon above their heads due to the cloud cover. Dust and debris has circled the world and will remain aloft for years, maybe as much as a decade. The loss of sunlight has already cooled the world a few degrees, and the wind bites with extra chill despite it being the middle of summer. The world won't descend into an ice age as commonly feared, but it will fully counteract the effects of global warming and drop global temperatures by several degrees for years. The family is quiet as they eat, each lost in their own thoughts. They can't remain where they are, but though none of them will admit it, there really isn't any place to go either. There are no safe zones from an extinction-level event. And though they set out in the morning for the west, heading toward the far mountains and the national park at the foothills, they have no idea that nothing but matchsticks will be waiting for them. The fires have killed over half the vegetation on the entire planet, and what remained has been dying for months, from lack of sunlight and effects of extreme acid rain. The only hope is to find pockets of civilization that haven't been consumed by fire. Maybe they can find more canned goods to survive off. But eventually those will run out or go bad, and there's no knowing if either will happen before sunlight hits the earth again and plants and trees return or not. There's various doomsday seed vaults around the globe and well-planned long-term survival shelters where a tiny population of humans have survived impact. In all likelihood, humanity won't go extinct as predicted. Will it ever be what it once was, though? That's doubtful. What's been lost is incalculable, and even if humanity rebuilds, it'll have scores of lost knowledge to rediscover. Once it tries to move to a second industrial revolution, it'll discover that all the easy gas and oil which fueled our modern world has already been greedily sucked up by their ancestors. Is there enough left for a civilization to grow advanced enough to mass-produce renewable energy technologies? Doubtful. For Michael and his family, though, all that matters is tomorrow, and each day looks a little bleaker than the last. Now you need to watch Can You Survive a Nuclear Winter and other nuclear stories, or have a look at what would happen if Russia and the US went to war.